mechanic is somebody who can fix something. An auto mechanic fixes a car, a body mechanic is a professional killer. I'm a card mechanic, I can fix a card game. Well, let's see what you have in the pocket, what's that? 10. What's that? <laughs> so the card you cut to, you just walked out with a million and a quarter. 100% used means they kill you when they're done with you. You know those Middle East gentlemen? He said, they own half the world. He said, we own the other half. You're not one of the best, you are the best. There's a big difference, right? You know what I consider the worst disability of all? Procrastination and laziness. Your ability, your talent attracted some interesting audience right there. Oh, and tell her, if I perhaps fooled you, do you want to communicate with me? My right ear reads lips. <laughs> I said, 400000 is a lot of money. He says, not for a judge. He says, now, if you ever want to have your wife killed, I can arrange for that. So look, before we get right into the interview, there's going to be a reveal here with my guest Richard Turner in about 10 minutes maybe, which you probably will flip out when you find out what the reveal is. But I want to say a couple things to you. I watched his documentary last night. It's called Delt. Only two documentaries have brought tears to my eyes, and you know I love documentaries. One was Senna, and the other one is His Life Story, which is one of the most emotional yet inspirational documentaries I've watched in my life. In the world of magicians and card mechanics, he's not recognized as one of the best. He's recognized as number one. You know you're number one when the best come and ask you for an autograph and picture. That's who we're talking about. Just to announce a couple of the things that he's had recognition-wise. He was a 2015 and 2017 Close-Up Magician of the Year from the Academy of Magical Arts. He's in the Hall of Fame at the Magic Castle. And on top of that, in 1982, Siegfried and Roy honored him with a Golden Lion Award in Magic. So with that being said, again, there's going to be a surprise or reveal in about five to ten minutes. But I want to introduce to you a very special guest. Richard Turner. Richard, thanks for being on with us here on Valuetainment. I am so honored to be with you here today, Patrick. It's very cool. I've been so excited about this interview. So excited about this interview because I am a product of like, uh, studying people, mm -hmm. and there are some that you study that you see, wow, this person really took their game to a whole different level. But you've been able to do it in your profession, in your personal life, in parenting, in your health, in so many areas, and I want to get into topics of, you know, uh, divergent, obsession, uh, you know, uh, some of the experiences with your sister, which we'll get into, maybe a little bit of Phil Ivey on what happened with him at UK when, you know, the $10 million issue that he had, I think was 7.2 million pounds. You know which one I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Maybe we'll oh, yeah. get into it a little bit of that. But, and then some other topics which will happen after the reveal. But prior to doing that, why don't, you, why don't you kind of do a little bit of your work and show us what you got? Okay. And what I am is a card mechanic. And you mentioned that term, and generally the public do card mechanic? You mean card mechanic? No, card mechanic. <laughs> and, the, and the term goes back like 50 years before the invention of the automobile. And a card mechanic is somebody who can fix a card game. In other words, I can make anybody win or lose under just about any set of circumstances you set before me and on just about any type of card game, which is different than a close-up or a card magician. Magicians learn certain tricks for the purposes of fooling and entertaining, but those tricks will not give them any advantage at the card table. The techniques for the card table are literally thousands of times more difficult to develop. There's thousands of very good card magicians. There's a, a dozen, half dozen top world-class card mechanics, card sharp, card sharp. There's a bunch of slang terms for it. But the bottom line, when you play poker, blackjack, bridge, whatever the game, you mm -hmm. want to make sure the cards are evenly mixed to start right. off with. So you have a deck, yes? I do, yes. Okay, so in the casinos, they give you about 20 seconds to give the deck three shuffles okay. in a series of cuts. So give your deck a few cuts. Oh, cuts or shuffles? Okay, okay, let's go, just go right into it. Okay. Shuffle, then this is basic casino procedure. Riffle, riffle, and then you have to give what's called a, a running cut. Okay. And you give it another riffle and a cut. That's basic casino procedure. Got so it. the deck should be pretty evenly mixed, yeah. yes? Yep, yes. Hold your cards in your hand off the table. Okay. Does that look pretty even? Are you kidding me? Do we have ace, two, three, four, five, six? Yes. Seven? Did I shuffle them back in the perfect order? Yes, you oh, did. I, what do you know? We did it. Okay, now I'm going to do what's called a casino watch. And I'm doing it face up. And that's for the purposes the camera can see that the cards are being scrambled because the magicians will have what are called shaved tapered cards where they're different sizes mm -hmm. and they can feel stick out. And so this will ruin that. Now I want you to take and give that deck a shuffle. Okay. And just set it right here. We're just going to, okay, and um, 
Uh, oh, okay. Uh, cut the deck in half. Just cut the deck. Cut off half. Cut off half. There cut you off go. half. Yeah, give me a, so you don't think I had you cut, give me a random number. Three, four, five, six, seven. 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 One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And what's that card? Ten of spades. Okay, tens are wild. Because in poker games, they have like deuces are wild. Mm -hmm. Sometimes trays are wild. Baseball have multiple wild cards. So tens are wild. Pan, pass, you shuffle that deck. Pass, switch with me now. Okay. Shuffle them up. Shuffle it. Now, have you ever played blackjack? I have. 21. Yes, I have. Have you seen the movie MIT, about the 21, the MIT students that took on the casino? Uh, anyway. I, I saw was, the interview. Are you, oh. are you talking about the movie with Kevin Spade? Are you talking yeah, about yeah. the actual interview uh, you did with MIT? I was on a TV show where one of these world-renowned card counters was going to demonstrate how he could beat the house. And what he didn't know is they brought me as the dealer for that segment. <laughs> We filmed for two hours, never won a single hand. He was <laughs> So if you're ever ticked. a dealer at a home game, at a house game, I shouldn't Good play there. Good luck. Okay, we'll burn a card, but I'm going to reverse it. Instead of me taking the money all, all the way around, I'm going to reverse it. How many players should we have at this table? Five. Three, five players. Where do you want to sit? One, two, three, four, or five? I'll sit at four. Number four. One, two. You're at Benny Benyon's place. You're right here. Number mm -hmm. four, player five, player six. Benny Benyon will let you make any a bet for any amount you like. Okay. Okay. One, two, three, and you chose four. Now watch this. Before I take your card, I'm, this is the burnt card, I'll hold it back. Mix, do something with those cards very quickly. Mix them, shuffle them. I shuffled one time. Put them back on the burnt card. Okay. And you're right here, number four. Yep. What's your first card? Ace of spades. What's that card? Queen of hearts. Bingo! You just walked out with a million and a quarter. But you just shuffled, you just cut, you chose five players, you chose to sit at number four, and you messed those cards up right before I took your card, and I took care of business for you. See? That's what a mechanic does. I fixed the card game. I made you... How does Vegas feel about you, by the way? Oh, they love me. I'm a, I'm a legend over there. They're very... Uh, the people that are in charge of catching cheaters are all very good friends of mine. So let me ask you uh, the opposite question. The guys that go and play, mm -hmm. do casinos cheat against the players? No. The safest place to play in the, casino, in the world now are in the casinos, particularly the, the upright ones the, you know, in, the, in, our, in the States. Because of gaming rules, their, their, their gaming licenses are so valuable that it's not worth risking their license to, to try to cheat somebody. Now you go back before the 1980s, when the mob was more in control, that wasn't necessarily the case. Now when the corporations have come in, it's probably, really the safest places to gamble are in the casinos because the security, the eye on the Interesting. sky, all the stuff they have is, uh, it keeps it pretty safe. Did mob ever contact you in the 80s saying, hey Richard, can we strike a deal together, do something oh, or no? Oh, yeah. you already want to get off of mob stories <laughs> now, are you? I have so many mob stories do to you tell. really? I want to get into it. Why don't you share a couple of them with us? Okay, well, it started in about 1981. Okay. Uh, in 1982, I was on a show called That's Incredible, so people saw me all over the world. And then the mobs, mob people started thinking, skills, dollar signs. This one guy first approached me and he, I, he wanted me to show him what I could do. He was a mechanic. And um, I showed him, he said, I'll give you $1,000 a day to come work for me. This is 1982, so I said $1,000 a day was good money back then. And then I said, no thanks. He said, 2000 a day. And again, I politely refused. And he said, how much will it cost to buy it? That was his actual, that's wow. exactly what he said. How much will it cost to buy it? And I flash back to my memories of the movie Godfather, where you know, he, the guy wakes up with a horse's head <laughs> in his bed. He made him a deal he couldn't refuse. And so I, uh, I said, no thanks. And that guy followed me around for about six years, trying to get me to work for him. And then twice, I watched him on the news with he and one of his New York partners hauled off to jail because one of their operations were, were, was raided. Another uh, offer came from the Middle East, started off with a phone call, very strongly accented voice, wanted to talk to me about doing business. And I said, meet me aboard the boat, where I was the nightly entertainment, I get aboard a boat, and there was five men of Middle Eastern descent, and only one spoke English. The interpreter sat here, the boss, and then three other guys didn't say anything. And they said, they threw a stack of bills on my table, so let's see what you knew of those cards. So I sat down and started showing how I could win, and do some of the things that you and I were doing. And then he says, we'll give you $10,000 a week to come to the Middle East and play cards for oil money. Because apparently there was a lot of Texans that played, you know, mm -hmm. had oil involve, involvement with the oil business, obviously. And there was a lot of high-state games they would play in. They wanted me to control which direction the money went. 
And I said, uh, no thanks. And he go, he was irate with me. He said, what? You're turning down $10,000 a week? I said, yep. We argued, he talked to his boss. His boss was mad at him. He's mad at me. And so they're arguing back and forth. Then he said, how about 20,000 a week? And I said, nope. They argued again. Now his boss is getting really mad at him for not securing a deal. He goes, 30,000. Finally he said, how about a million dollars? Now he didn't say if that was by the week, but I did say no. And they were so irritated, they had just received their food. They threw down their forks, they pulled, threw down their napkins, and threw another stack of bills on my table and left. And when I, got, uh, when I got the bills, I thought they were all like ones or fives. There was a stack of $100 bills. So I still had a good night, didn't have to compromise myself. Another person, very wealthy, very successful, and we were in his beautiful mountaintop mansion, and I was telling him about this offer I had from the Middle East, this million dollar offer I had from the Middle East, and he told me, don't take it. He said, in a situation like that, you'll be 100% used. He said, you understand what I'm trying to tell you, Richard? And for those that know, 100% used means they kill you when they're done with you. Mm. I told him, I know what it means. He said, you know those Middle East gentlemen? He said, they own half the world. He said, we own the other half. That's what he actually said, <laughs> we own the other half. He said, we can arrange to have these card games take place in the United States and we'll back you here. And you know what I thought to myself at that point? I thought, wow, I'll be 100% used in my own country. I'll die here, that's the deal I was looking for. I want fresh American dirt I want to be buried in. I don't want any of that foreign dirt. And now if you want, I can even tell you the scariest offer, but it's uh, it'll take a couple minutes. I, I want to hear it, tell us. I'm on a flight, headed to a performance, and I hear this paper rattling next to me. All of a sudden this guy lowers his paper and says, hello, Mr. Turner. I want to talk to you about doing a little business together. And I thought, how did this guy know what flight I was on? How did he know what seat I was sitting in? Anyway, he, he was oh, a diamond God. broker from Sun City, South Africa, and he wanted to offer me two to three hundred thousand dollars to play cards in these games. There was a jar, large Jewish community. He was, his mother uh, was Jewish, his father was Italian, and he wanted me to play in these games to, once again, control the direction of the money. And we had a conversation, and it was nice to be flattered. He was flattered to have someone recognize you and talk and, mm -hmm. in the plane land, and I thought that was the end of it. That was just the beginning. Uh, I'm in a hotel. I just finished, do, we did a lot of media, I just finished some television appearances, and then I, and my show, and now I'm in my hotel, and the phone rings. And so the phone, he goes, Richard, it's me, Diamond. I'm downstairs, let me buy you dinner. I, I, I nicknamed him Mr. Diamond because he was a diamond dealer. So I, I called our chauffeur, his name was Ira, and he uh, took me, he said, take me down to the restaurant's, uh, res uh, hotel's restaurant, go down there, and he, and he said, Richard, have a seat. He didn't offer to stand or shake my hand. Mm. He just said, have a seat. And then uh, Ira left. He held his hand up in front of my face and said, I know your aversion to, well, you know, shaking hands. And I thought, how did he know I didn't like to shake hands? Now, it wasn't because I was weird or quirky. It's because the moisture or sweat from other people's hands affects my touch with the cards. So, you know, if someone was sweaty or whatever, that would, that would diminish my touch. So that's, wow. that was the reason. Interesting. And so I thought, how did he know that? Oh, not even a half a dozen people know that. So then he said, hold out your hand. And he handed me a five carat diamond pinky ring. Back then the gamblers wore these big old pinky rings. And Mr. the first guy I mentioned, he had a big old giant one, the biggest of marble. He says, we're $70,000. He says, it's a gift, a token of my good faith. And I knew if I accepted that ring, I would be owned by him. And I gave it back, said, thanks, but I'm not all that hot on jewelry. And um, so then I'm on the road again. I'm in another hotel. I walk in uh, another place, another city, walk into this uh, bar, sitting at the bar again is Diamond. He goes, Richard, let me buy you a drink. I thought, how did he know I was gonna be here? I didn't know I was gonna be walking in here. So we sat, talked, we sat at the, what, the little, uh, one of those little uh, two-man uh, booze. Mm -hmm. He's across and he, he goes, now you're in the martial arts. And I thought, how did he know I was in the martial arts? And he casually put his hand on my shoulder. He said, now, if you, you know, and he reaches across there like it was a small table. Mm -hmm. And he put his hand on my shoulder. If you know, what you do is you take the punk, and then obviously grab my head, but, you know, behind me mm -hmm. with my head. It went to just drive my, my nose into his forehead. He what you do is you take your thick skull and you drive it in the punk's nose. Call it what you want, Glasgow kiss, West Texas takedown. He says, sometimes if you're lucky, the punk will bite through their own tongue. And now I'm scared of this guy. And then we were getting ready to leave. He said, hey, you're, you're in the entertainment business. Perhaps you'd like to be on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Take this. This is Johnny Carson's 
business number, his personal number, and this third number is an answering service. Just leave a message that you called and I'll get back to you. I had no way of directing him directly. So I got home and I went to a friend of mine who was involved with our karate school. His mm -hmm. name was Chuck Curtis. And he was the captain of one of the most successful SWAT teams in the history of law enforcement. He took down a number of serial murders, included David Allen Lucas. And he said, with these mobsters being followed, you need to be able to protect yourself. And you need to have a, a, a handle a gun. And of course, I was looking for a leery of guns. So anyway, I'm gonna speed up the story for you. So he had me for six months out on the sheriff's firing range. He'd throw a rock at a target, I'd aim and fire, and he armed me with a Walther PPK, James Bond gun of choice. And then I realized, I can't take the gun on the plane. I had to check, that back then, you had to put it in a locked case that mm -hmm. the, the airlines had the key to. And then and that would be very dysfunctional. So I'm in another city, and again, Diamond's there, invites me to have dinner with him, and he goes, you know, he tells me how it cost him $400,000 to buy off a judge for a murder he had committed. And I said, $400,000 is a lot of money. He says, not for a judge. And he says, now, if you ever want to have your wife killed, I can arrange for that. I can make that happen for you. He, he, he did. He said, there'll be an accident. He said, there'll be an explosion. Boom. He said, no one would know you were behind the killing. He said, I just wanted to let you know that's another service I can provide. Now, I was this guy really scared me, but that's half the story. The rest of the story is even more interesting, but I told too much already and taken too much time. Wow. So your, your ability, your talent attracted some interesting audience right there. Uh, the, yeah, and that's, that's, that's four out of a, a dozen interesting stories. I think this may not be a bad time for us to make the reveal. What do you think? If we kind of let the audience, or do you want to wait a little bit? Is that okay with you? Oh, why not? Well, why don't you make the reveal? Well, I see with my mind and my fingers. It was 1963. I was told you will eventually lose all your sight. He had an eye disease, something they can't do anything about. My vision started going south when I was nine. My sister Lori and I both got scarlet fever. We don't know if this is what caused it, but it was the only thing that was the commonality between the two of us. And my retina, first my macula started dissolving, which is the center part of the retina. So within all, overnight, within a, a minutes almost, there was like a hat in front of my face, a hole. And then out of the hole, went, uh, started losing, the blood started uh, not going to the rest of the retina. And so the, my best corrected vision out of the corner was 20 over 400, which is twice as low as what's considered legally blind. Then that hole eventually encompassed my entire retina, so the whole retina has been destroyed. And so that's why my touch uh, uh, is so fine, is the, the neural network that uh, went to the visual cortex is now focused on the, the touch areas of the brain. So that's a, kind of the cool thing. Now, what are the odds of you and your sister, though? A and, and both of you took your life, and you, you didn't use that as a crush to say, hey, because of this, I'm doing this. You still pushed the envelope. So I've, I've read a lot of stories, mythical stories about Bo Jackson, right? There's a uh -huh. Bo Jackson jumped over a 40, you know, for this, and J Bo Jackson ran a 40 in this fast, and uh -huh. Bo Jackson did this when he was a kid. Some of the stories I hear, one of your friends was talking about the stories that you were buying a motorcycle and you would go and you would go climbing. And why don't you talk about some of the wild things you did growing up? I've had a bunch of surgeries because of my high impact living. Well, I'll tell you the motorcycle story. I came up with a great idea for the blind and deaf driver. So I bought a motorcycle and I had a friend named Jim Blowers and I had another friend who was deaf named Roy Otterman. He was my auto mechanic. He would sit on the back and say, right, right, left, left, he had a big old strong guy but a little high squeaky voice. Left, right, right, red light, red light, green light. And one day we were pulled over for suspected armed robbery. There was a Winchell's donut shop that was held up and we fit the profile. And uh, so we're pulled over and then uh, there, were, the, there was only one small discrepancy with us being the suspects. The getaway driver wasn't blind, his accomplice wasn't deaf. And once we proved to the cop that we couldn't see the lights flashing or hear the siren blasting, I, re I received a ticket for driving while blind. He let us drive away. <laughs> True story. And then he says, you better hope you get Judge Lord. And then when I went to court, uh, they switched judges right when it was my case. And I was scared this last time I motor rode my motorcycle. I thought, what am I going to do? And I went up to Judge Judge. I'm so sorry. I, I can't get a license because I can't see. He says, what? You can't see to get a license? Well, case dismissed. I thought, 
Is that it? <laughs> he totally looked at the wow. thing from the opposite point of view. I thought he was going to yell at me, what the heck are you driving a motorcycle for when you can't see where you're going? Instead, he went, well, you can't see well. Case dismissed. Anyway, so, um, and then I, uh, you know, I started in the martial arts March 5th, 1971. And we had one of the toughest karate schools in the country, actually in the, anywhere in the world. And to get a black belt under my karate instructor, John Murphy, you had to fight a 10 round bout with a fresh opponent each round. He figured if a boxer can go 10 rounds with the same guy, he's gonna do the same thing except you're gonna have a fresh fighter every round. So it'd be like Ali going Frazier, Holmes, uh, Foreman and so on. And they're all black belt, the ones yes. you're going up against? So exactly. they're black belt and they come fresh to you for, three, for, for those rounds? If for three minutes each one, exactly. And so it took me 13 years and three months of training before I was at, ready to take on the 10 fighters. But to start off with, my, for one of my first tests, I had to fight five two-minute rounds. And he had his testing across the border in Tijuana because he didn't want to deal with lawsuits. Mm. And so it was across the border because it was really by, almost like cockfighting. You know, to be perfectly frank and put it in a, you know, because it was very radical. And we we're barefisted and there was very, very few rules. We respected the knees. The only place we didn't shoot were the knees. And we wore a cup and a mouthpiece. Anyway, so my green belt test, which I had to fight 10 too many guys. And I was, I, it was August 2nd, 1973. It was 105 degrees outside with a 90 plus percent humidity. And the, the oh dojo was this solid brick building, block cement block building, 30 by 50 foot, no windows, no air conditioning, not even a fan, one door to go in and out. And there was like 75 sadistic, sadistic spectators all crammed on benches because they always liked when these blood baths came. You know, they came there to watch the blood bath. Anyway, I got so beat. When I was done, I was drinking out of a Tijuana toilet. And I, my friend comes in who was there testing for his black belt that day. He goes, you realize you're drinking out of a toilet? And I'm going, <laughs> I was just gasping for air because I couldn't breathe. I didn't care. But so anyway, that caused me to realize Okay, if I'm going to overcome asthma, because I had asthma, and fear can trigger an asthma attack. Mm. And you can't fight if you can't breathe. So I started putting myself in crazy positions, and Jim Blowers is, was there for a lot of it, as was a whole lot of other friends. Um, you know, I'd climb thousand foot cliffs. You know, we climbed the tops of Split Mountain, 80, 100 miles outside of San Diego in the desert there. And uh, that was, uh, there's a whole bunch of stories just there. Um, I, I learned to swing on the trapeze. Uh, Bob Yurkus, very dear friend, wonderful man. He's 86 years old now, done more stunts than anybody in the history of Hollywood. And uh, he had a whole circus in his backyard. And I lived with him in the early, in the 1973, 73, 74, 75, 76, in that time frame. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I learned to swing on the trapeze, take high, uh, high, high falls, a tightrope around the rim of multi-story building. Tightrope. Tightrope, tightrope, uh huh. Were you like this prior to being blind or did this happen this, after? Oh, no, this is after, this is all. I, I, I guess was, what I I'm trying to ask is, were you pushing the envelope your entire life from the day yeah, you were born? I so was, this is not a new thing. You were wired like this from day one. You wanted yes. to push the envelope. When I was five years old, I got a lot of attention because I have a, I have a, a eidetic memory, a photographic memory. Well, there's no real such thing as a photograph, but I have a eidetic memory. And I took a, I did a picture that I saw in National Geographic mm -hmm. with a finger paint, and they're going, look what Ricky did, and they were all stunned. And so all first, second, third grade, that was my, kind of my identity was my ability to paint and draw. And, um, and so I always pushed it, and I always wanted to be good at whatever it was. Then of course, when the vision started going south, then all of a sudden they couldn't paint and draw anymore. And that kind of, uh, you know, at first there was some rebellion that took place, and, uh, but then I, I joined, a, I, graduated high school early and I joined a theater company. And my director was a man named Steve Terrell. He was a TV and movie star back in the 50s, early 60s. One of the, uh, Stephen King, his late, one of his later, latest books, uh, 11 63 about the assassination of Kennedy. Uh, he references the movies that Steve Terrell were in in his, late, his book called Drag Strip Girl, starring Steve Terrell. Steve would sit there and watch me. Well, first of all, he taught me how to play the part of a sighted person because I'd be on stage mm -hmm. and I'm interacting with another actor and I'm looking like this because I had no forward vision. So here's the hat. So I'd have to go like this and look out of the corner mm. of my eye to even see where your silhouette was. Yep. And so, and he goes, and he and the director, well, he was the director, he and one of the assistant directors were going, you know, I could hear him talking, it doesn't look right to the audience. He goes, Rick, 
Rick, can you look at the, uh, your, the person you're talking to? Because from the audience point of view, it doesn't look, make sense why you're talking to this person. You're looking over here. So he taught me how to play the part of a sighted wow, person. Wow, what, what a skill to learn. And, 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 I had, and I had to learn it in different ways because there's different visions. There's close-up vision. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, so if, I'm, if I want to focus on something that's five feet away, that's a different look than if you're looking at something that's uh, 50 feet away. You know, there's, you know your, your eyes will adjust. So I had to train myself to give that impression when I'm looking at somebody that's uh, five and a half foot away like you are versus somebody that's uh, 10 foot away. Anyway, so, and then he would see me, watch me, before and after scenes, I'm sitting there practicing moves all the time. And he goes, you love cards. He said, if you become the best card man in the world, you will earn the respect of others and that will open doors for you. When you earn their respect, doors will open. And he quoted the old Apostle Paul who said, run the race to win, become the best. So those words stuck in my head and so that really kind of was one of the foundations uh, for my obsessive focus. So I started putting in an average of 10 to 20 hours a day. A day. A day. And I, my average practice day was 14, to be perfectly honest. You know, a low day would be 10 hours. Average was 14. But there would be a day I'd get up at 6 and go to bed at 3 and I would have practiced for a full 20 hours, 21 hours. And the only time I was not practicing is when I was training or fighting. That's the only time the cards were not working. Or, or when, even when in a shower, I had waterproof cards. When I'd be in the Pacific Ocean, I had cards with me. Well, your wife told a funny story. She, she told her friend, which, which this is one of the funniest part of the documentary. She said, uh, one time, um, you know, Richard and I were making love. And while we're making love, I hear him, I hear him shuffling the cards. She hears this. <laughs> 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 well, you know, my hand, that hand was free. <laughs> so, you know, why, why waste an opportunity to at least one hand practice? So, so the, the, the obsession, I'm curious if we get into a little bit of the obsession. Maybe, you know what, before we get into it, why don't you show one more? You want to show one of us, okay. another trick oh, of yours? Okay. Um, this deck has been shuffled a bunch of times here. Uh, we deal with my favorite game, which is seven card star. I'll show you how far I can push the envelope. Okay. Uh, give me a number. Okay, move those here. Let's these cards out of your way. How many players should we have? Um, five. Five players. Where do you want to sit? One to five. One. Five and one. So right out of the chute, this is you. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five. You chose this one, number one. Mm -hmm. Now watch this. I want you to take these cards. I want you to mix them up. Okay. And then pull out a stack and hand them to me. I don't want you to give me the whole deck back. Okay. And I'm going to have you do this each time we go around the table to make this as impossible as possible. So just mix them up and then pull out a stack and put them in my hand. Okay, and I think we left uh, one. Now we have player two, player three, player four, player five. Now we have the door cards. What's that card? Jack of spades. Take them back, mix them up. You have the whole deck, mix them back with the rest Makes of them. Mix the whole deck. The okay. ones with that, yes. And then hand me any part of the deck you want. So you're going to do everything you can to make this, like I said, as impossible as possible. And the point is, people say, how can you tell what a card is? In this case, even if they were face up, and you could see every card coming off the deck, to control it in this instant, what's that? King of clubs. Those cards go together. Mix them up. Have me any part of the deck you want. And we're going to see what we can do. We're playing seven studded. We always play what's called high Chicago. That means high spade and the hole splits the pot. So hand me a random stack of cards again. And we have player two. We have player three, player four, player five. Player one is you. What's that? Queen of spades. Jack, queen, king. How are you doing this? I'm doing pretty good so you far. Are, uh, yeah, but you're, how are you making it happen? I have no idea Mix what you're up, doing. Man. This is actually pretty interesting because this is different. Yes. If you have control of it the entire time, that's one thing. But, but here... you are doing everything you can to screw <laughs> things oh my up. Gosh. And we have player two, player three, player four, player five. You chose number one. What's that? Come on. What is it? Come on. It's ace of uh, diamonds. How did you do that? <laughs> Come on. Go, Patrick. Go. Mix oh, up. my gosh. Hand me a stack. There you go. Oh, he's getting stingy. That's three cards less than last time. Okay, we have player uh, two, player three, player four, player five. Now the last card they called the expression down and dirty. This is where it came from, this game. One, two, three, four. Put that last card with the rest of the stack. Okay. Once again, you shuffled, you cut. You chose five players. You chose to sit at the first position. Mm -hmm. And you shuffled each time and handed me a random part of the yes. deck after you mixed them. 
We're playing seven stud, high spade, and the whole splits the pot. Let's see what you have in this hand. Again, what's that card? Ace of diamonds. Ace. What's that? Queen of spades. Queen. What's that? King. What's that? Jack of spades. So you're sitting on what would be, would be a, the equivalent of an inside straight. Only one way would fix it. What's that? King of spades. A pair of kings. That's good. What's that? Ten of clubs. Ten, jack, queen, king, ace. Ace, high straight. We're playing high spade, and the whole splits the pot. What's that? Ace of spades. Half the pot. But you shuffled, you cut, you chose how many players, you chose where you wanted to sit. R all Richard, all I did was This cheat. is scary right here, what you just uh, did. Only this if there's money, even... oh, especially when there's money involved. Oh my gosh. So you did everything you could to, slow, to try to mess me up. And sorry, but you were the big winner, so you should be happy. Yeah, but this is, ins and this is insane here. How do, how and, do my, this... and my mentor was a man named Di Vernon. I mean, Di Vernon, Di Vernon is the guy that he, he tricked Houdini in front yes. of his wife, right? And Houdini's uh -huh. wife that. initialed on the card or, you know, and he, right. by the way, this is what he said about you. Having seen countless number of card experts execute for over 80 years, I consider Richard Turner to be by far the most skillful. He performs the most difficult moves with the greatest ease. I doubt if anyone can equal him. He does things with cars that no one in the world can do. No one. Now, this is Di Vernon saying this about you. you know, I know. It's pretty darn cool, <laughs> I have to say. And, and, and for those in the business, know who he is. For a century, the whole 20th century, he was the most influential person in the whole area of magic, sleight of hand, close-up magic, gambling work. And he kept making it come back to the top. Okay, take all these cards, turn them one direction. Turn them one put, direction? Yeah, because put, because put, two put, of them are, two of them yes, are, uh, okay. Yeah. And, uh, and put the rest of the cards back with them. Put the, in other words, put the deck back together. Okay. You want me to turn the cards or no? Leave them the yeah, way they are? Yeah, turn them all faced up. Make okay. sure all in one direction, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Di Vernon had very nice things to say about you. Yeah, and he was born in 1894. Yep. He mm -hmm. lived to be almost 100 years old. My wife, years Kim, old, and I uh, threw him his 98th birthday in 1992. You want the cards up? You want uh, the face up or no? Why not? Face up. Okay. Name a card. King of hearts. Take out the kings. Okay. Take out the four kings. Okay. And I'll, while you take out well, the kings. take all the kings? I'll take out all four kings, okay. yes. Uh, King. Um, but yeah, he, uh, I, anyway, uh, Vernon took a liking to me back in 75, and I became the recipient of a century worth of his most guarded card table artifice. You got your kings? I did, yes. Okay. And what he would do, and which was kind of unique and w brought to my attention later, had him to me face up. What's your favorite suit? Uh, spades. Pull, take the spade. Okay. Okay. I'm just for now. I'm just going to leave him sit there for a minute. Okay. Um, so he would, uh, when he would describe moves to me, because I couldn't see what he was showing me, mm -hmm. he tricked me. He didn't describe them to me in the way that he could do them or the way that anyone else has ever been able to do them. But he believed in naturalness, in doing things in a way that you don't think something is happening. And so he described them in a perfect manner, and he would say, Richard, this is how it's done. And he'd put the deck in my hand, and, and, in his hands, and, he'd, and I'd get as really close and try to get an idea, and mm -hmm. then I'd touch his hands. Mm -hmm. And so he showed me, this is how it should be done. And, only, and I spent thousands of hours, tens of thousands of hours, working on many different moves, techniques, controls, and it wasn't until years later that he admitted to me that he made them up. He did not think they were possible to do that way. He did it just to see what this obsessed kid would come up with because he would see that I would put in 10, the 15, hours. 20 hours a day. And then every time he'd see me, he would, uh, he would go, that's it. And what you just saw there, when I first, with the one I read, just that stud, mm -hmm. stud him, I was, we were at the Magic Castle in Hollywood. And I said, Professor, what do you think about combining this with this and this? Because uh, I thought this is the ultimate. This is the most deceptive, ultimate way to control a game. And he goes, it's not possible. He said, your brain can't work that fast. Your hands can't be that sensitive. You break rhythm. It won't work. It can't be done. He said that to you. That's what he said to me. And I'm standing, I'm standing, he's sitting at the, at the bar at the Magic House. I'm standing there going, and I was depressed. I sat there and I was, I was going, oh, bummer. He says, it can't be done, but it's the ultimate. Mm. It's perfect. And so for about 10 minutes, I was depressed. Then all of a sudden I thought, hold it, but I can do it. I said, Professor, come watch my show. And so he came into the, we watched my show at the castle there, and he came out and goes, Richard, what the hell are you doing in there? I don't understand what the hell you were doing. I said, remember when you said you can't do this and this? That's what I'm, I don't understand how the hell you can do that. I, and anyway, for the next 18 months, everybody that came, came over, Max, come here, watch this, Max, watch this, shuffle the cards, how many players are you? And he would go on and on and over and over, and then 
Two years that later, he goes, I, I still don't understand how the hell you can do that. And so he, even knows he, exactly what I'm doing. He can't do what you're doing. No, he, no. Seriously, he can't. Di, Di Vernon couldn't do what you did. Almost everything I do in my show, the techniques and the methods that I'm using, it's very exclusive. There, you won't see it done again. I put wow. it that way. I'll show you some moves. See okay. that? There's your king of spades. Yes. yes. Now I want the king of spades. This is one of the, one of the things that Professor uh, showed to me. We deal we deal cards around the table. Watch face up. See how the card stays as the second card mm. is dealt. But see uh, this particular second deal is actually named after me. It's called turn a sweep second. But what I have to do is my left thumb must apply the precise amount of pressure to push over exactly 22.6 thousandths of an inch. And that is the, and, and that's the caliper of two cards, see? Exactly two cards. And so, and then my right thumb, it only has a, 60, a 64th of a second as it's sweeping across the deck here to engage that second card and then deal it out. You know, it's only that blink of a moment. Uh, now I'll, I'll do it, see? Because you, know, you figure out what- Is that top or bottom, what you're that's doing right the now? the second card. It's the second card. Your, your other kings are still on the bottom, see? And here, I'll do it. Oh my gosh. I'll do it real slow, really be to slow it down. Get some more cards back here, so I used them all up. <laughs> all right. So I'll, were you I'll, a math guy? Were you a math guy growing up? Or? Not really, and none, nothing I do is based on math. It's all based on finger control. Mm. Fingertip control and touch. See that card, you king? Let's see if I can do this really, really slow. This is, this is one of the first second deals that I, that I came up with. But you do it really, really, really slowly. You turn it face up so you can f see a little more clearly. See, but you have to deal the card. Second card is neatly. That's, see, Vernon would talk about re re you know, relaxed grip, re natural grip. And see, here's here's one-handed. Now, when the card's face down, see when it's face down, see it's hard to tell that you're being taken. But that's that's dealing seconds. Anyway, so he kept showing me move after move after move, and. And he would describe them to me in a way, and so I developed them only to find out that he couldn't do them that way, and other people couldn't do them that way, and a lot of the times he just thought they were, it was flat out not possible to do it that way. Say a number 10 to 20. 10 to 20? Yeah, pick a number. Okay, 17. Okay, I'm gonna try to cut with one hand 17 cards. Come on. Count them. Come on. Well, we count them, we'll find out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Come guess? on. Pat him back, pat Come him back, face on. down. Okay. Come on. <laughs> I mean, how could you do that? Uh, okay, we. One hand that I just said in one second, you gave it to me. Let me try this. Four and 10, two different numbers at the same time. One, two, three. I got that one. See if that's 10 cards. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, Come put on. him back on the deck, face down. <laughs> okay. Now take the deck and cut it. Cut half the deck and put the other half on top. Cut okay. it and finish it. Okay, now, because people are, are always asking, why would you waste your time developing a touch like that? I'll show you one of the purposes. Give me a number of players in a card. Well, three, four, five, pick a number. Four. You're my partner. You want to set it one, two, three, or four? Uh, two. F four and two, okay. And once again, as we mentioned earlier, the way you're allowed to shuffle in the casinos, the deck has to stay face down on the table, okay. riffle, shuffle, and it's because you know, it's the hardest way to control if you're going to control. Four players, second position, mm -hmm. take the deck, so you don't think I'm doing anything dirty, deal the card off the top, face up, player one right here. Okay. And I think you chose kings and you're player number two, face up a card right here. What's that card? That's king of clubs, first player one was three. nine of hearts. Player three right here, okay. and player four. Okay. Start here again, player one, okay. number two is you. Okay. What's that card? <laughs> um, uh. Player three. Okay. Player four. Okay. Just keep circling the table. Player one, tell us what number two is. Oh, my king again. That's Start Betty, big time oh there. Patrick makes gosh. money off the producer. Oh, my gosh. And did I get the last one? Ten. Ten uh, deal, the next, deal the next card out of curiosity. King of spades. I missed. So let me, do you exp let me explain what happened Sure. There. I shuffled your cards back in the deck exactly where you chose every fourth position starting at number two. But I missed one of those shuffles by the thickness of 11.3 thousandths of an inch. And that's why that one card was off by one, that one card was off by one card. Are you kidding So me? I explained how and what happened there.
So listen, obviously a lot of our viewers are entrepreneurs, but you're also an entrepreneur yourself because as an artist, you found a way to monetize this. And this is what you've done for a living for many, many years. So how did yeah. you find a way to monetize your ability? And, and monetizing a close-up act is different than like David Copperfield because he can put 10,000 people in an mm, audience. Good point. Mine, it's intimate. Nowadays, we have video projection, so when I toured China, we, we mentioned, you know, they had the most, I was in the most beautiful theaters in the world. I mean, the screen that my show was projected on was four stories tall and, tall and five stories wide. But how I made it viable for me is I became an asset, an added asset to my performing venues. In other words, I was hired to entertain, but as an added bonus, I got them what is known in the industry as earned media. Mm -hmm. You probably know what that mm -hmm. means. I got them, I got their name mentioned in primetime television, worldwide television, newspaper figures, magazine cover stories. So I would have long-term running engagements. I had one engagement that went 2,190 days in a row. That's seven days, seven nights a week performing, six years straight. And it was because whenever I, you know, I got them, well, I, I, Ripley's, that's incredible, all kinds of shows. I'd, and I always made sure they mentioned the places I was performing in and on those shows or in the, on the, all the different media. So they got very expensive advertising just because I was there. And I replicated that in a number of different places over the years. And that's how I made it more viable. And of course, now with projection, now I don't need to do that so much. I had people say, there's no way you can make a living. And they were, they were, looking, they were looking down at me, going, you're crazy if you think you can make a magician with a deck of cards, make a living with a deck of cards. And so I, had, I actually had it all calculated out probably two or three years before I actually did what I did when I got that first long engagement from 1979 to 84 on that riverboat. And that changed the game. That changed the game. There was a story saying how when you were seven years old, you liked to watch the show Maverick because right. the guy would do magic tricks and you would sit right in front of the TV and your mom would say, hey, what are you doing, Richard? And is that where the fascination came from for you, from that movie you watch? Is that what it was for you? Yeah, it was a, a TV show called Maverick starring James Garner. It was a Western and he was a gambling, he was a card player, mm -hmm. a card shark. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there would be people at the table trying to cheat him. He'd out cheat the cheaters. And I thought he was so cool. And so I wanted to be a gambler like Maverick. We were very poor. We uh, had four games. We had Monopoly, checkers, chess, and a deck of cards. And I was the oldest. One thing about the oldest, I had this thing about, I didn't like to lose. So, and we play cards for M&Ms. When we'd get a nickel and we're able to get a deck of pack of M&Ms. So we'd play cards for M&Ms, and the red being the most valuable, the brown being the least valuable. And I wanted all those M&Ms for my sisters. And so we, we played cards, and I started noticing, if I dealt myself one extra card, I increased my percentages like by 20%. And so I started coming up with these ways of give it, creating an advantage. And that's kind of where the uh, obsession started. And then my sisters would tell her girlfriends, my brother's so good, he never loses. And that just encouraged me to keep developing more and more things. Your sister, she said she lost her uh, uh, vision a year and three months after you or some number. No, her, yeah, her, yeah, hers was a, a, a couple of years after mine, but we both, I was nine, she was five, and we both got scarlet fever. What are the odds of that, by the way? Like, what did oh. the doctor say when that happened? Well, our whole in, uh, elementary school was in quarantine, and they gave them an, an antidote, or, and we had to take something else, and uh, we don't know. And the thing is, that's the only thing that they can figure that caused the vision to go south because of the exact same thing happened to both of us. And for me, I was in my fourth grade class, teachers writing, Mrs. Gaston writing on the chalkboard, and all of a sudden, the chalk just got like someone took a ration and smeared it. It was just, and I'm going, I'm trying to, I, and then I looked down at my book, and I couldn't see the print, I'm going, and I, Mrs. Gass, and I'm sorry, I can't see the chalkboard, and sent me to the nurse, and so that's what happened with me. And my sister, same thing, within 60 seconds, it's like the lens on a camera just mm -hmm. went fuzzy mm -hmm. on you. You know, I, I noticed one thing is when, when, when I sit with people that become the best at what they do, not just one of the best, but the best at what they do. Like, you're not one of the best, you are the best. There's a big difference, right? 
almost every one of them that I talked to, there was something happened that was extremely painful growing up. And I think it happens to a lot of us, right? Mm -hmm. When it happens, imagine God, if you believe in a, a higher power or, mm -hmm. you know, if you believe in Greek mythology, like you're being tested to see how you're going to react because this is your chance for the world to know that you could be the best at something. Every one of these guys has a very difficult story in that moment when we're being tested. You've shared a few of them in a documentary. What would you say some of them were? I know you said one of them, your mother once, you had a book so close to your uh, 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 eyes oh, yeah. you were reading and your mom said, do you have to put the books up close to you? And you remember that when you explained that. How many more of those instances happened that stayed with you? Well, a number of them. One of them that stayed with me was we were forced to watch a movie called Lord of the Flies back in second grade, third grade, fourth grade. It was about a group of boys that were stranded on an island and they, be, they became savages. And there was one kid, on the, one kid on the island called Piggy. He was chubby, wore glasses, and he had asthma. And the other kids end up, they go off in teams and they end up taking Kip, Piggy and they end up killing him. And I was always afraid of turning out like Piggy, you know, because I would, except I was skinny, blind, and had asthma. And then there was another show called Lost in Space. Jonathan Harrison played Mr. Smith, and he was always the coward hiding behind this rock while this goofy looking monster would come up while the little 10 year old Billy Mummy goes and saves the day. And I was always afraid that I was gonna be like that coward. And, I, and the same thing with Tarzan movies. I'd watch Tarzan movies and there were always a scene where they're going across a tree that fell across you know, some canyon that's a thousand feet below and then someone would always stop and go, whatever you do, don't look down. And then there's always the one person that stops and looks down. Ah! You don't go screaming to their death. What if I'm that coward? And so it was because of the fact I can't, I can't see. How am I going to be able to deal with things? How, how's a woman going to want to deal with, want to be with a guy that can't see? And it caused me to flip and just go all the way to the other extreme. And I took extreme risks, wrestling seven foot sharks to. Oh, I, 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 what, did you say wrestling seven foot sharks? Yeah. <laughs> you want that story? Give it to me. I love shark hunting. And we go out off Nine Mile Island, which was about, well, nine miles off of the San Diego Point in the Mexican waters. It would pour blood in the ocean. And I was always the pole man. I'd have a marlin pole, small marlin pole with a 12 foot steel leader, 120, 140 pound steel leader, 120 pound line. And the sharks start circling. And then they would grab your bait and take off. Then I had to pull the rest of the 12 feet by hand because it couldn't go through the eye of the thing. And then another friend, we called him Gaffer, he would gaff the sharks. And then my friend Randy Dick, he was our shot, shoot, his shooter, he would shoot it because you can't kill a shark once it's on the boat. And we had these red snapper heads and guts tied onto the back of the boat. And the seven foot blue starts start chomping on those things. So we pull that, that rope in grabbed a gaff and gaffed him, put a bullet in him, but he's not dead because he only put it in the middle. So I said, hang on to him. So he's holding that shark by the head and I reach in and I grab them. I figure if I can get a noose around his tail, we won't lose him. So I'm sitting there, got this thing, and I'm sitting there trying to muscle the darn thing with one arm. With the other hand, I'm trying to tie a noose on his tail. I thought it'd take a 30 seconds, it'd take me about six or eight minutes. And finally I got a noose on his tail. We shot him, pulled him on, on board the boat and then, <laughs> started chewing on our gas lines. So he's sitting there chomping away and Randy goes, somebody better stop that or we're not gonna be out to get home because we're like many miles from shore. And so I said, give me my softball back. I grabbed my softball back and I went back and went, damn boy, damn boy, I says, heel, heel, heel. And I, you know, you hit that shark hard enough and he's finally settled down. And about five minutes later, there he is again, mouth up and down, chew, chew, getting ready to chomp our gas lines. And I, the second time when, you know, you do it until the eyes pop out and, Anyway, the shark stopped. I relate, I mean, not at that level with you, what you're doing, but the, the idea of somebody said you couldn't do it, the idea of somebody tried to feel bad for you. You grow up poor, people give you money, they say, oh, poor you, oh, poor this, and you don't even want to get help. Like, I remember I had a challenge asking for help for a long time. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like, I don't oh, need your help. Too. I don't want you to help me out. I don't want you to help me. I don't need anybody's help. Seems like that's a little bit of a, a positive thing, but also it's a little bit of a, a Achilles heel because it limits yeah. you to how much you can grow because yes you want to prove a point that you don't need anybody so because growing up you had something but then eventually if you want to do something big and be able to do it for a long time you need help from other people how did you overcome that and and what was the process and was it your sister talking to you was it your wife talking to you how did you go about saying I don't care I don't, I'm okay getting help now when I was first asked to be on the a show called that's incredible at the time it was one of the biggest shows on television and they wanted me to walk with a white king I said I'm not gonna do that that's a tip-off 
You know, the blind people do that. I'd get in their face sometimes and I wasn't, I wasn't too polite about it because I wanted my stuff to stand on its own. The thing is, as the years went on, mm -hmm. the vision kept going south. And before I could, I could, uh, I could, when I fight, I could at least see out of the corner of my eye where my sil the silhouette of my target. I have a very rare condition. It was first documented in 1760 called Charbonnet Syndrome, it's French. English is Charles Bonnet Syndrome. Mm. And Dr. Oliver Sacks, he's a best-selling author, he's written a number of books on the subject. One was called Hallucination, the other one was called The Mind's Eye. And that he calls this scene with the mind's eye. So my condition is where other people that have lost their seat just see black, they mm -hmm. lost their sight, they see, mm -hmm. see nothing. I see a 360 degree, degree kaleidoscope of beautiful, vivid, every shape of royal blue, blues, reds, Greens, every every shape of, uh, and then when I'm in the red spectrum, every shape of uh, royal red down to the, you know, to uh, everything in the red spectrum, and, and then sometimes they will intermix with each other, and then in amongst all this is every subconscious image you can see just float around. So just picture yourself underwater with a light shining in, breaking down the prism, the light spectrum, and in the water is just thousands of things floating around. That's my normal state, and you can block me in a vault with no light of any source, and I'm still, these v things, these, these colors and say, uh -huh. are just as vivid. And the cool thing is, I can, I can zoom in on any particular image, zoom it up, I can take my beautiful wife and zoom her around in her bikini and uh, whatever, um, you know, and then, uh, or, or, or I've designed houses, I built decks, and I would engineer, my wife would watch, I would sit in a chair and I watch, I'll watch the whole thing, like a th uh, uh, it's like living in virtual reality. Okay, I need tw tw uh, four by 12, so it's beam, and they'll have to be anchored over here. And I'll engineer a big, giant project without a single piece of paper. Uh, my, at that time, my, my dad was my cutter. I'd say, Dad, this board needs to be 192 and a quarter inches. We cut it, we built this three giant, uh, oh, I don't know how many square foot, giant deck, all different uh, uh, layers, uh, levels, and all without a single piece of paper and all engineered uh, with this CBS, Charles Bonnet Syndrome. Now all of a sudden, I, I, I couldn't see anything anymore, anything that's real. And see, I could go like this. I could put my hand in front of my mm -hmm. face and I will see a digitized. I guess that'd be like uh, something that's not flesh looking. I don't see things flesh looking. Okay. It would be, but I will see something go back and forth like a pendulum. Okay. I close my eyes, I see the exact same thing with the colors just as vivid. And so I, was no, I would go like this and I couldn't tell that there was nothing left. In other words, out of the corner of my eye, I could not see my hand move because, and I didn't know that I had lost the rest of my sight because my CBS created the vision that I had. So then now I'm running into everything under the sun. I, my, my wife were sitting there, recliners at night, and the phone rings. I dashed to answer the phone. I ran square into the corner of the wall. I split my head wide open. She looked from her, up from her book and she said, now that one had to hurt. <laughs> when, when you get off the phone, don't forget to wipe up the blood. So in our family, me running into things is par for the course. Happens every month. I either have a big split face or a black eye. And sadly, it's almost always before I do an interview, somehow I managed to not have one for you. And um, anyway, so uh, she kept trying to get through to me, you need help. Mm. You need to ha you need someone to walk with you. You need to touch somebody, you know, because I just kept hurting myself and so finally I realized that nothing what, that I was seeing was real and that for me was that was as a big of a loss to me as if you just went from your 2020 mm -hmm. to zero how that would be to you what little I had meant as much to me as what you have means to you because I went from a independent disabled person to a dependent disabled person mm. in that I now needed somebody to touch as I walked. I needed somebody either to touch me or I touched them to keep me from walking off cliffs, which I've done, falling down. Really? <laughs> My wife and I were, were, were she, we were roller coaster junkies. We're, um, we've climbed giant mountains, seven foot, uh, seven mile high mountains in Montana. And whatever I do, she'll do whatever she does, I'll do. She's a man, she's man, fantastic. You've been married, what, 28 years? You We've said, been together 20, 28 years. Uh -huh. 28, you have a son, which uh, you've named. So the name of your son, can you talk about that? I mean, obviously you came up with the name, but. No. 
You, uh, you, you didn't come up with them. Your she son's came up with. Here, oh I'll tell you what my happened. My, uh, my son's na- our son's name is Asa Spade, spelled A S A, like King Asa <laughs> from the Old Testament. And King David's great grandson was King Asa. And the Bible says, and Asa did what is good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He was one of the good kings. And she, and she said, and it means physician or healer. And then my wife said, and his middle name could be Spades. And I thought, Ace of Spades, that's perfect. That's the perfect sa- name for the son of a card check. She goes, no, no, we're not naming our son Ace of Spades. <laughs> I said, yes, that's perfect. She stepped in it, and once she stepped in it, she couldn't get out of it. Oh, my God. So that's what a great name. And he Ace loves his name. Turner. He's world famous because of his name. People know him all over the world because, and they say, I would kill for Richard Turner's son's name. He's got the coolest name in the world. And he doesn't go by Richard or Asa Turner. You know, after his father and her mother, he goes Ace of Spades. That's, he goes by the name of Ace of Spades. You see people that do very well on their career side, but some, you know, not necessarily family and then kids and all that. So that kind of becomes complicated and difficult to do. For you, 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 you become the best at what you do here. Your marriage, 28 years, and you guys seem like you're having a blast oh, wait, uh, together. Wait. And then your son going to where he's at and he's, you know, good kid doing the right things for himself. Your sister, so you become the best at this, but your sister, which is fascinating, is she, you said she ran the largest uh, construction company in Idaho, in the state of Idaho? Yeah, at one time they laid more, found, more concrete than any other construction company. She didn't rent it, she ran and was the owner of it. And her name was Drott, Drott Dairy Construction. They built big dairies and then it just became Drott Construction because they, you know, she works on very, very large projects, 10, 20, 50 million dollar projects. That's amazing. What, yeah. what values and principles did your parents pass down to you and your sister? What were, if you were to say my parents or my mom or dad always said these three things, what were those things? Well, my dad was just nothing but a positive influence on my sister and I. We always Got said it. we had the best dad in the world. My, all, all of us, my, my brother says the same thing because he loved us unconditionally. You know, there's, in the Greek, there's different types of love. Aga, mm. you know, eros, agape, storgoi, which is a family love. Eros, uh, philia, which is a fran- 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 family love. And agape is a, a, like a God love, an mm-hmm. un- unconditional type mm. love. He loved us with no con- conditions. And he just, he literally gave e- everything for us and to us. And he was just, he was just uh, nothing but an encouragement. And, and here's, Here's how he was. He'd go, hey, yo, cheat. And that's how, that's how my dad addressed his son, me. Hey, yo, cheat. And he said it with affection, and, and he was so proud, you know. And wow. So I got, my nickname was Richard Turner the Cheat. So I went by that for years. If you look at old publicity things, it was always Richard Turner the Cheat, in quote. So you'd say the number one thing from him was uh, passing on love to you guys. And, 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 and his, his, the way he did things. He did things to perfection. Mm. He, was, he had a seventh grade education and became uh, a, one of the top engineers for a number of big, 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 big companies. And he was to start off as a welder, but he would engineer things and he would do work on projects. He worked on the f- uh, Alan Shepard, John Glenn, the first spacecraft, all the way up to the f- uh, first space shuttle. And he would um, work on uh, things in the nuclear, to, uh, nuclear area. Wow. And, um, but, and he would come up with ideas, but because he was working for them, they got the rights to the patent, he got the pat on the back. If he wasn't, you know, he could have been a very wealthy man, but money meant nothing to him. And whatever he did, he did it to such perfection. Um, and I would watch him growing up. He would, somebody would come over and they wanted to build a, a, an engine or whatever. He would, he would do it. And then I would just be so amazed. And I thought, wow, I wish mm-hmm. I could do that. I wish I had talent like that. And then when they would want to pay him, and he, he spent all the, the whole weekend doing it, he, would, he would, never would take a, a dime. So we, uh, we talked about Phil Ivey briefly earlier. So what do you think? I talked to Phil Hellmuth, and I was asking questions about him as well. Obviously, you're in the world, so you see a mm-hmm. lot of the poker and all these other things that happens. What do you think about what happened with Phil Ivey in, in uh, London? Well, I think he is owed that money because there's what's called advantage play. And if the casinos are dealing a game where if they have something, if there's a flaw in their game or with their cards and, and you capitalize on that, that is not considered cheating legally or ethically. And, uh, and you know, he, they, he was playing according to their rules and everything was wide open and now for them not to pay him, I think it's wrong. He deserves to be paid. So, so I want to wrap up with a quote you said at the end of the documentary. And I know one thing that I uh, heard from the Variety is the documentary 
uh, is now leading to a movie that they're doing on your life. And the pe who were the people that came up to you that are doing the movie on your life after watching Delft? Mark Ordersky and Jane Fleming. They're with Court Five. He was the executive producer of the uh, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. He won 17 Oscars off that one trilogy alone. Those three movies, and uh, he's produced you know 60 major motion pictures. And they took a liking to Delt, and they uh, they were, were in the development stages of, uh, of uh, moving towards a narrative. You said something in the documentary. You said, I think the loss of my vision ended up becoming a blessing. It made me who I am, and I am thankful for it. I like the way I see. How long did it take you to say that and believe it 100%? Well, that came from my beautiful wife, Kim. It gets back to your earlier question when I had to face things. She would, she would say, you got to get over yourself. You got to let accept help from others. You are, you know, you are, yes, you're Richard Turner, the blah, blah, blah. You know, you're not, you're not impervious. You're not Superman, even though I like to think I am sometimes, but I'm not. <laughs> anyway, she said, you can't, fa you can't deal with if, what, what, what you're not willing to confront. If you're not willing to confront something, you can't deal with it. Mm. And so um, she told me basically, get over yourself. Accept help from others. And, you know, when I went... What the heck? I don't need it. I'm old now. I don't care what people say about me. I've made my mark, and um, yeah. So it's been a good 25 years, but it okay, was okay. So it's been a long time. It's yeah, been a long yeah. time. So Richard, any final thoughts for uh, entrepreneurs out there? I know you're. Uh, uh, you, you've talked at MIT, and you said the two curse words are hard work. And on Penn oh, and Teller, you mentioned the fact that the biggest, the two biggest disabilities in the world are lazy and procrastination. Why don't you talk a little bit about the mindset uh, of how you think to get yourself to the point of being the best of the best? I say, don't let anyone tell you something's impossible. You know, have a healthy disregard when someone says something's impossible. I say, take possible out of impossible. You know, and I understand that time to time we're dealt a better hand or two. That's how we approach that hand if we choose to fold, whine, quit, sit on our pity pot, a lot of people do, or take your disadvantage, whatever it is, turn it into an asset, become like a soldier, and, you know, become a warrior, and go all in, like we're talking about with Phil Ivey. Ivey, go, go all in. That's what separates losers from the winners. You know, don't let anyone stop get in your way and don't don't hit them or knock them down on the way smile at them and you know, you know I had a you know I, I, I was kind of like this for a large part of my life now <laughs> you're right I am a blind bat but let's go have some fun that's a great attitude <laughs> you know for for some some of us you know we make the lamest excuses to say, well, you don't understand what I went through and what I did this and what I did that, and we use that as a crutch and I get to the next level. And you're a prime example of somebody that can go out there and take all the excuses away. By the way, we're going to talk on a side note about looking at your calendar on your availability next year for inviting you to our conference because I'd love oh, to see man. you guys perform uh, for our guys so they can see you. I'm sure after seeing this interview, people are going to be fascinated by the story. But you also get invited to do a lot of functions, right? So how do oh, people yeah. get a hold of you? Do they contact your agent? Do they go on your website? Uh, yes. Uh, my manager, uh, Kim at RichardTurner52.com. My website is RichardTurner52, had so many cards in a deck, dot com. Put Kim at in front of that, and you'll get right to my manager. And, you know, I speak and perform all over the world. I just got invited to do a television special in Japan that I'm, we're negotiating the contract on that. And I'm, that next week I'll be with uh, Apple. And anyway, so it's really fun. I enjoy speaking. And for some reason, people are inspired or encouraged when I do, even though all I wanted to be was a performer. But now uh, I'm a speaker performer. So I do my car stuff within my speaking. So it's also entertaining. Yeah, no, <laughs> your, your message is, is multidimensional. It's not one dimension. You have a multidimensional message that can inspire. Well, it's already entertained a lot of people. I think your story can also I inspire mm -hmm. tens of millions of people around the world as well, if it hasn't already. Yeah, they, uh, when I did, I did a special for Japan, they said I've been seen by over a billion people now. 214 <laughs> countries by over a billion people. That's amazing. To I know it's creepy. creepy that is way. amazing. To it's me. creepy, I think, to me to think about that. Maybe we'll see my ugly old mug. mug. So, <laughs> by the way, ugly old mug, mug you, you look like you belonged in a movie. You look like a Chuck Norris slash like a 
Burt Reynolds, good-looking <laughs> model that should have been in Hollywood doing movies. You had you had the whole thing. If you if you see this documentary, you're gonna see his physique, and you're not gonna believe he's got the chest of a bodybuilder. He's got the arms of a bodybuilder, a fighter. By the way, there's a couple things I want you to do. If you watch this here, you were inspired. You got to go watch the documentary to really understand the story and the scope of things because there's stories, videos of him. Some of this thing we didn't even get into in this video here today, in this interview here today. So do that uh, too. If you do want to book him, reach out to uh, his manager, send that email over. And then three, comment below what you took away from this interview. And if you haven't subscribed, click on the subscribe button uh, to join Valuetainment. And if you have the alert button, click on that as well to join the notification squad. So with that being said, uh, Richard, thank you so much for being on Value Tim and here with us. Truly, thank you for coming out. My pleasure. And here's one thing. Here's something you never do when you play for money. Never shuffle a deck in That's each hand. Just amazing. It makes the other players get up and run. That is Patrick, I was so honored to be thank with you. you. The, You've the been a real pleasure. pleasure. All mine. Thank it's you so much for coming one. out. Well, Truly, thank you. Okay, I, I'm sure you've played in different types of poker games. I have. Where the deck is passed around the table. You know, where it's... Deal, 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 it goes around. Mm -hmm. You just yes. handed me a shuffle deck, so it's my deal. Now watch, I'm gonna use Casino Procedure, what I just showed you, and I'm gonna try to do what's called Call a Slug. Riffle, riffle, you do a running cut. Okay. And another riffle and a cut. Now, we're gonna deal a hand to hold them. You choose, after the fact, you can tell me how many players. Five, six, seven, how many are at this table? Six. Six, okay. Keep, well, hold your, put your card, there you go, perfect. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Burn, and we have a flop. What are those three cards? Nine of clubs, king of spades, ten of clubs. And the ten is wild, remember? Yep. Tens are wild. Yep. You chose, what's that? Oh, almost dropped it. What's that? Jack of hearts. So right now, with the wild card, there's possible a straight, what's that? Ten of spades. So there's two wild cards yes. on the table. Now you're my partner sitting over here in hand number five, just casually raising the limit. Let's see what you have in the pocket. What's that? Ten. What's that? <laughs> so the card you cut to, I took care of business. So with that other wild, uh, thing, you would have had a, a royal flesh. Actually, you would have had five of a kind. Oh which, my gosh, we're in the wrong business, man. We gotta go like <laughs> make a round at some casinos in Europe. Well, they, the, they already know who oh, you are. Oh yeah, everybody time. knows who you are. Big time.